There is a new paradigm of trauma in trauma-informed and nervous system-informed therapies and education sweeping the country. And in this episode, we will go into that as well as other parameters surrounding mental health and learn a little bit about expressive writing and how it can really help people in between therapies. I'm going to be speaking with Diego Balan, licensed professional clinical counselor out of San Francisco, and Dr. Yaner Balan, MD, a psychiatrist also out of San Francisco. Together, they've written a book, Rewrite, a trauma workbook of creative writing and recovery in our new normal. And They wrote this together during the pandemic, and they both had worked in New York before. Of course, Diego Balan was working as a clinical counselor in New York City, treating patients on society's margins. And she also had written a book um, with Yanar Balan called The Big Book of Emergency Department Psychiatry, A Guide to Patient-Centered Operational Improvement. She was born in Germany and raised in Istanbul. Diogo's upbringing provides her with a fresh perspective on how to navigate tension between cultures, adverse child experiences, and attachment wounding through hope and resilience. The other guest today is Dr. Jenner Balan. He's a board-certified psychiatrist and best-selling author, of course, of Rewrite, a trauma workbook of creative writing and recovery in our new normal, like I just mentioned, and the big book of emergency department psychiatry. He is a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and is currently the Vice President of Behavioral Health and Medical Specialty Services for a major healthcare organization. He has years of extensive experience working in high-volume emergency departments and is an expert in hospital operations, including work in the emergency room, healthcare businesses, and management. He's given lectures and workshops worldwide. He was born in New York City and now lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. I believe you are really going to enjoy the interview with both of them today on the Intentional Clinician Podcast with Paul Krauss, your host, licensed professional counselor. It is my pleasure to bring you this interview. And today's episode is sponsored by Therapist Billing Services, LLC. Billing services by therapists for therapists. That's therapistbillingservicesllc.com. All right, let's get to today's interview. Welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast, Diego Balan and Yenner Balan. And we have Diego is a psychotherapist and Yenner is a board certified psychiatrist. And I'm excited to have you both as I've talked about your biographies in the uh, introduction and your new book, uh, Rewrite, a trauma workbook of creative writing and recovery in our new normal. So welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, good morning. My pleasure. So I've been reading the book and I very much liked it because it was getting right to the point of kind of what's been going on in the culture with stress and trauma and also what are our solutions? What can we do about it? And it had a lot of, it almost, it said this, I think you said it's sort of a textbook in a way, but yet it's also a self-help book because it was explaining to me or whoever's reading it, all of these different treatments and ideas, as well as giving you a whole half of the book on writing prompts and different uh, ways to get help and to regulate the nervous system. Uh, So I guess I want to hear, people love to hear a little bit of story. Why did, why why did we decide to write this book? Um, This book came about during the pandemic uh, when the need for mental health was so much amplified. And I saw this in my own practice where people just needed a lot more support because all the things that they used for coping really was off the table, like extracurricular activities or socialization. So it was um, the main idea was to kind of extend the therapeutic process beyond the 50 minutes. And uh, at first I just started with writing exercises, but I was finding that it wasn't really working because everyone was in such high anxiety, high fear mode that, of course, you know, when we're in survival mode, we can't really process our emotions or we can't really make meaning or even think rationally. So that's how I started to incorporate some Uh, grounding techniques, some breathing exercises, just to help people regulate their nervous system on their own so that exploration could be possible. And 
I also, we also saw a lot of people just doing self-diagnosis and getting a lot of information online about their symptoms or going for to TikTok for uh, making sense of what they were going through, which was very dangerous actually, and led to a lot of misdiagnosis and a lot of um, treatment, uh, you know, trials and errors that may be worse than symptoms. So that's why we also, I also wanted to incorporate some um, evidence-based theoretical information and have it all in one place where people can understand their symptoms and also work through them. It was also a uh, it was also a way for us as a family to put together this artifact of what life uh, was like and continues to be like during this extremely traumatic, essentially equalizing uh, problem throughout the world where uh, at the, when it first started, our son was eight, he's now uh, almost 12. And to be able to have this product in the world to show what things were like for us as parents, but also as professionals uh, at work in the community, uh, so that we could empower our son and his generation to see how things really were like. And so this really is something that that we hold near and dear as, as something that's tangible and physical as, as to uh, what things were like and, and how we want to impact how things go in the future. And it also helped us personally because we, it gave us something that made sense to us, that we felt useful. It, it was like a coping mechanism for us. I mean, we also watched a lot of Netflix, but it, <laughs> it was it was also just something where we felt empowered in in some ways where we were used our own creative expressions and things like this, where it felt in such a bleak time, it felt like we were actually um, making something that possibly could uh, help people. Yes, I could definitely see that. And I feel like uh, I haven't, I've read a lot of books about trauma, but I feel like this book was like really just getting to the point quite in a good way, like that you were explaining things to educate somebody who doesn't have to be in grad school. You don't have to have like a master's degree to understand this book. It's written in a very understandable way. And it really, because, and it's got the exercises, but I really believe you also were able to maybe qual calm people's anxiety with the book because, like you said, I think when people were stressed out during the pandemic, well, it's still going on, but the main portion where everything was shut down, um, they were just getting online and, and thinking they had, you know, all sorts of things and trying bizarre uh, modalities that had nothing to do with psychotherapy or psychiatry in any sort of way. And that can even lead to re-traumatization or more trauma because then things go really wrong so i liked how that um that brought it out so i i want to i want to know uh right now i i think this is a i i do think that the pandemic led to a paradigm shift because um some therapists i know and and uh not i don't know as many psychiatrists but they try to help people with the core determinants of health trying to help them get connected to community, um, have some coping skills, have different things. Because if if you're a therapist, you see somebody about an hour a week. And if you're a psychiatrist, you see them, what, 15 minutes every couple months or something like that, unless you're old school and you do psychotherapy as well. So kind of helping people be empowered to know what's going on rather than kind of the old system where they kind of had to come to us to get the information. You're like giving the information if they have the time or they give make the time rather to to educate themselves. It's kind of helping their core determinants of health because then they have these extra resources and connections and understanding how they fit, which accelerates the treatment um, usually in a good way, like a, a, a better um, prognosis. If you're doing stuff outside of the therapy and psychiatry room, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, so much of what we uh, talk about uh, these days, but and also we're continuing to write about is the concept of understanding not only the trauma, but also the positive possibility of change, right? Mm -hmm. the, the ability to create uh, post-traumatic growth, which is a you know technical term, but the ability to then understand uh, what can come out of that, reflecting inward and being able to then connect with others. And as Doiga was mentioning, the, the lack of resources in terms of social connection 
connection and uh, the ability to have uh, the support networks that we may have taken for granted before uh, now have been amplified in, in terms of the need of understanding the concept of autonomy. And that's something, another piece that, you know, this book starts talking about in terms of things like informed consent. And, you know, as a physician, I talk about this, you know, regularly in terms of understanding why and how you're doing things and other reasons why to do or why not to do things, but also the concept of being able to say, what can I do for myself as I ask for help from others? And so the, the idea of being able to shift from asking and needing to be able to say, what do I have from within to be able to give and produce so that when there's the time to ask for something, I know exactly how to not only process that, but when does it sort of end? How do I know I'm better? How do I know where this sort of session ends or the treatment ends? Or how do I know where I need to stop and maybe try something else? Yes, that's very good. I think for so long, our the field of mental health is focused on the negative and I think that there's, and I think it's important so you know what's going on, so you can then identify and treat the situation. But I also think, and I'm not bringing some positive psychology into this because that's a, that's also a different modality that's got its own pros and cons. But just the idea of empowering the consumer with the information of what it looks like when you're on the spectrum of mental health in a mild, moderate, severe, or just an adjustment episode and thus empowering them to know what it what it does look like because it's counseling and psychiatry we want to get you back to a functioning point where you were before or a new functioning point necessarily we might not necessarily solve all your existential and spiritual and personal concerns but we want to help you be empowered to solve them and i feel like this book was kind of bringing that out which is like here's a bunch of tools and here's the treatments as well kind of like choose your own adventure is the more time you put in the, the more you're going to get out of it yeah yeah and that's not just one way that there is many different ways of healing and that it is just very person specific that all these are just based on generalizations but we're all unique in our own journey and being able to understand and kind of connect ourselves with things that work for us so it doesn't it's not something that will not one fits all um, modality therapy is very very personalized and unique and, and the ongoing needs for different things like cultural differences, linguistic differences, religious and spiritual differences, to be able to then say, how do you understand yourself within your own risk factors? And to your point, we we wrote this so that everyone can understand it, right? So a middle schooler can pick it up or an advanced clinician, you know, can, can also pick it up, use it together or separately to be able to then say, how do I understand what my risk factors are? And we also talk about the protective factors uh, towards, uh, you know, and that, that have worked in the past, but also have worked during the pandemic as it relates to uh, being able to survive this psychologically, survive issues that are extremely impactful, but how it's meaningful in terms of the way that you see the world, that way that you appreciate the world. And this could be language, as we talked about culture, these kind of elements where that you can personalize it to, to Duygo's uh, point, where we can then say, how do you then as a family unit, as an individual, as a community, understand what your own values are so that you can understand how you want to sort of make decisions going forward? And the therapy process actually really reflects this. It changed so much than what it was before. Now the therapists are becoming much more diverse and they're also using their diversities a lot more. So in the past, there was kind of this notion of the psychotherapist or psychiatrist being this blank slate, which has its own benefits because it just leaves room for, uh, you know, transference and for the client to play out their um process and their dynamics with with the clinician but it also can be very limiting because ultimately humans need to connect to other humans so for the uh, clinician to use their humanness their you know their personality their um their creative expression and also even their own stories uh, uh, in the purpose of benefiting the client, of course, which, you know, um, so this, this, uh, this, I feel like is very refreshing and it, the changes that are happening around that are extremely powerful and they're not even just limited to culture or uh, ethnicity. They're also 
personal life experiences. Like for instance, there's many addiction clinicians who use their own journey of healing and sobriety in their um, process and in their work with with clients, which is so powerful. And I think this is just super important. Yeah, I agree with that completely. I think the field is changing for the better. And a lot of that has come out of the trauma-informed literature and the culturally sensitive implicit bias trainings and things like that, that I think you might be referencing. And also the idea of when psychotherapy started out, it was more like the practitioner was in a power role and they were sort of above the client and they were like a poor mentally messed up person and we had to help them versus seeing them as another human on an equal field. They just don't have the expertise you have. So you're a guide and a helper and you're there and you're trying to find out what is it about their story that and their situation and where do your skills fit in and what modalities fit in and also how you use your own personal experience. So a big thing that I've been seeing for the positive and at my clinic that I work at, <clears throat> we, we encourage, I mean, we don't can't mandate, but we strongly encourage if we're going to hire you that we want to hear you're doing your own work, right? Are you in psychotherapy yourself, right? Because if, if you're a person that is a psychotherapist and you've never been to psychotherapy, I very much have a personal uh, explicit bias against that. I think that's <laughs> wrong, right? And I think that that is part of it is is being honest and authentic, which is the authenticity movement's been happening. Is like I may not tell my clients, you know, my whole personal story because it's not about me; it's about them. But I will definitely, if they're in a tough spot, I can say, okay, I can sort of understand that, even though you have a different story. Um, I go to my own therapy and and that that kind of helps them and and maybe I'll talk a little bit more, but that kind of helps them go, oh, okay, it's not just me. Okay, this isn't just my problem. And 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 what coping skills did you use? And not that I get too much into it, but I'll say, well, I've done EMDR therapy and it was very helpful. And I, you know, I've gone and seen a psychiatrist and I've talked to different doctors because sometimes you go through really rough times in life. And I think that gives people hope, right? Versus like, oh, I'm this messed up person seeing this doctor fix me, right? That's sort of old school. And, and that, you know, we see that still in the nonprofit world. We call it like uh, kind of like toxic dependence. Like the clinician or the clinic is trying to make the, not make it. They, I don't know if they're doing it on purpose, but they essentially make the person have learned helplessness versus our idea is that unless you have the most severe combination of factors, that this is a time limited stay of service to help you. And then you get out there again and do it. And then maybe if things go wrong, you come back or whatever, but like that we're trying to help you function and get out there not just keep slap a label on yourself that you're mentally ill for the rest of your life. That's not a good uh, way to live. So I did love that. I felt the strength based, I guess I'd call it uh strength based empowering message in the book um, and to give the information to the people that is, medical and peer reviewed but yet you wrote it i you must have had a good editor because you wrote it in a very uh much better than textbooks i had in grad school like it was like readable like i was re i read this like very quickly i was like just cruising through it and i still am there's like cool pictures in here so i think that that paradigm is that we're changing from this like top down model to a more fluid integrated um exchange could you talk about i mean we should probably define trauma if people listen to this podcast they know about trauma but they, maybe this is the first episode so could you talk about trauma and maybe how trauma treatment is changing in your opinions um so trauma uh, is is basically the, uh, an experience um that you're you you're reacting to an experience from a, from the past right like so maybe uh, there's triggers that um really remind you of something that may have happened and this could be a, a dynamic a relationship dynamic with with your parents it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a one single incident actually most of the time in family trauma it isn't it's never really isolated to one incident it's I, it's more of a series of incidents and um the way that trauma treatment changed over time is in the past, it was more about 
telling was healing. So it was more about like the, if the person told the story over and over again, it was considered healing. And now we know that that's not true and it's not effective and it can actually lead to re-traumatization. And also some people actually don't really have access to the memory. Something may have um, happened in pre-verbal stages of their lives. They may have, for instance, be in an accident, in a car accident where they lost a parent at the age of one years old. So they're not going to have the verbal memory, but they will have the trauma triggers. They will have emotional responses and they will have certain narratives around this incident that they carry for with them um, throughout their lifetime. So this is right now workable because we work with body sensations. We work with uh, nervous system. We work with identifying and understanding triggers. We work with self-exploration and awareness. So we don't really need the story actually for this. Yes, I definitely agree with that. I think that is where treatment is going is we're not just looking at the story of the verbal uh, happening. And I think that's an evolution of the field because the old way of seeing things was, I think, a little, well, not a little bit, majorly biased towards high-functioning individuals that grew up in a semi-normative uh, household without a major degree of trauma, right? And so that was maybe where the clinicians, who are, who are way more privileged back in the 50s and 60s, if you're going to college and university, you probably had a degree of some degree of privilege. Therefore, they're kind of taking that idea and putting it on the patient. Okay, well, tell us about what happened right? Well, if you grew up in a dysfunctional household, or you grew up in a war-torn country, or if you grew up in, you know, and you had a bunch of things happen to you, you may not, like you said, have the language. You just feel it in your body and your moods and your uh, sense of self and the world and sense of safety is completely ruined, but you don't know maybe how to express that, right? So, so uh, like for instance, EMDR, I don't really need to know the whole story, um, for some people, it is that there are targets that uh, the things that plague them, bad memories, flashbacks that are obvious, right? For other people, it may be that they just feel a certain way every time they're in this certain situation. I, we don't, maybe don't even know why that is, right? But we do the processing, and eventually, we desensitize them to that feeling so that they actually feel they can feel more like themselves in certain situations that feel uh, upsetting to them or in emotional uh, exchanges with others. So, and that and that's one way of doing it. So, and a lot of therapies like mindfulness-based stress reduction and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and some of these writing prompts you're talking about are very much focused on what's going on now and trying to get help you become resilient now, bring your timeline back to the now. Um, and like you said, <laughs> telling the story over and over, that was a good first start with, with therapists, but it doesn't work because that's actually just installing negative things over and over even more um so could you tell us i mean and, and with trauma you know it's such a catch-all word these days we call it trauma informed i wish we could call it nervous system informed therapy or something like that because we all have trauma it's a matter of the degree of trauma and and we all have stress and if you have stress and trauma and the perfect combo for some people that creates post-traumatic stress disorder and other people, it creates depression and other people, it creates anxiety and other people, it creates a personality disorder and other folks, they just feel their body feels messed up to them. They feel stressed out. They can't sleep. So it's very dependent on so many multiple factors and the epigenetic makeup of the person. So could you explain maybe, um, you know, a little bit about post-traumatic stress disorder because that's like a big catch-all word and then maybe down the spectrum on how like somebody without maybe that degree of symptomology you know may also need to find these resources we're talking about in your book sure so so think about from the perspective of why we're even talking about this work think about it from the perspective of the person in school or the person at work or in the community or in a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody that's just you know, in the world and, and why they're even bringing this up and why they're going for treatment or why they're recognized as having something that they need to work on, let's say. And so when you work backwards from that understanding, you know, getting back to sort of the, the you know, time zero of, of the event or the series of incidents, being able to see how that shifts and, and changes the person's mind, their brain, the, the makeup of how they actually uh, interact with the world 
difficult because what it actually does, and, and I won't go into too much you know, the details, but what it actually does is it changed the, not only the chemistry, but the structure of the brain itself, which is mm-hmm. fascinating. And I like how you, you know, your, your desire to reframe the, the word you know, trauma to, to the nervous system piece, because when you start to understand, and a lot of the education piece in, in workforces, but also in school systems that, that Doug and I do, is to be able to understand and help folks be a little bit more sympathetic, empathetic, or just a little more understanding of the fact that if somebody comes to a a, a setting with a changed brain, where they understand and their ability to have emotional regulation, their ability to even process and understand things and then express things is fundamentally changed and different, not good or bad, it's just different now, then to say, hey, what are the, what are sort of the, the down, you know, downward sort of sequelae of what happens to that? Well, the inability to process events, inability to process information, but then also things like acting out. Things like, as you mentioned, the whole physical symptoms from headaches down to you know, GI and digestive sort of issues, immune system issues, uh, issues relating to the breathing systems and the heart system, right, the cardiometabolic issues. But then also to be able to say something like in the workforce or at school, hey, wh- why is this person not paying as much attention, right? Something like in the workforce, they call it presenteeism. You're there, but you're not giving 100% of yourself. Absenteeism is easier. You know, the person just doesn't show up to work or they're absent from school. But these are uh, concepts that are now much more uh, intertwined with burnout. Uh, and I'm, I'm starting to look at things like even post burnout where you know you're you're really talking to somebody but they're not even there uh and and to see sort of the burden on the individual but then also in terms of the the system and the community and so getting back to sort of the concept of understanding post trauma post traumatic stress disorder and any of these these uh stress related issues is to it, at the heart of it is to be able to say what is different? How am I interacting with the person? And we're a lot more comfortable, or at least uh, mindful of talking about in terms of cultural diversity and sensitivity and equity and, and these kind of concepts. And now this is, a, I think, a meaningful extension of it getting back into sort of the mind and the body to say, there's something different with this person. You know, if, if we speak Turkish, and you, you, I don't know if you speak Turkish or not, but you might not speak <laughs> Turkish. But if we have to find a common language, English, we can do that, or we find a translator. And so I think what, what, what as, as therapists and clinicians, what we do is sort of provide that the synthesis, but also the translation to say, hey, this is sort of how you're understanding, or this is how you're processing what's going on. In, inside, and then how you can then relate with the other. And so this is, a, a I, I think, and, and you used this word earlier, this empowerment, where you have the ability to then say, and I really, I love the choose your own adventure. We can talk about that forever, you know, the, the, sort of the nerdy fun stuff. But, you know, to be able to then say, how do you then create the ability to make those decisions so that they're based on uh, less fear, but and more resilience and and uh that's sort of another another piece of what you know what Doug and I talk about specifically about you know s- states of fear and being able to then have uh decisions made once you're past that and so uh, those are some of the some of the concepts that we we think about and talk about and then there's the uh, there's the clinical emergency uh kind of treatment right when uh people come but then there's also right now with trauma treatment kind of changing there's also a lot of trauma that were not really called trauma before. Mm. So certain things, certain narratives that we are get downloaded in our early relationships that are not really functional for us, that don't work for us anymore, or certain survival mechanisms that we may have adopted that just get in the way with our relationships or get in the way with our success and our living up to our own potential. So there's a lot of actually benefit in looking into yourself and trying to figure out, you know, these repeating cycles, these repeating patterns, these narratives that you may have learned. Like, for instance, if there there was a parent who left um, or there was a very difficult divorce, um, the narrative that the person ad- adopted might be, anyone who loves me will leave me. So this narrative, of course, gets in the way. And this might not necessarily be uh, noticed as trauma. This person could function and they could live the rest of their lives with this notion, maybe. But they will never be able to break certain cycles unless they become curious and self-aware. And therapy really provides this atmosphere. Absolutely. And so kind of one thing I want to talk about before I ask you more about the writing part, because I'm excited to get into that little preview, but something I've been thinking about, and you can both comment on this, is I have this this sense, like, so when somebody comes in for, let's just say, 
EMDR, which is Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing Therapy. Of course, Francine Shapiro wishes she named it Reprocessing Therapy because that's a lot easier to say. But too late. We already have an institute <laughs> and 30, 35 years of research. So uh, it's not going to change anytime soon. So when somebody comes in, those like the obvious ones, like I've been doing pretty good. And then I was in this car accident or I was doing pretty good. And I lost a job or uh, I was doing really well. And then somebody died. And, and it wasn't just the normal adjustment period. It became all of these symptoms, just awful symptoms, nightmares, night terrors, avoidance. Uh, I don't have the book in front of me, but like pretty much almost PTSD, right? They went from a functioning level that was what we would say is, you know, in the medical world is a quite functional human to person who could hardly do anything besides maybe eat and sleep. And they're debilitated. Their friendships uh, are, are hurting. Their ability to work, their ability to kind of take care of themselves is declining. And then there's the folks and, and so that's like an obvious one, right? Where somebody else might have it more mild, it turns into like an anxiety issue or depression issue. Um, and then there's the folks who come in with like this, like, you know, from the adverse child experiences study where they have all these horrible things happen to them as a child. The difference I, I've been seeing is when somebody has these things happen between zero and 25, and depending on their environment, if they don't have a good group of uh, friends or family around them, the child is egocentric. And so instead of seeing these, you know, things that happen to you, like the person comes in, they say, oh, I was in a car accident. So obviously I'm feeling this way or somebody died. So obviously, and I lost this job and it was my best job. And, you know, obviously I have this bad thing happen. Oh, wait, you call it trauma. Okay. Now I understand I need to address that thing. Right. It's not just it's not just like, wow, you're thinking wrong. Cognitive behavioral therapy 101. You're thinking wrong. Let's keep practicing thinking right. Think better, write more, you know, it's like, okay, we have to address why you're thinking wrong. Right. So, yes. you know what I mean? Like if somebody, I, I, I don't know, if somebody has some sort of, you know, medical issue, you don't just address the issue. You address why they have the issue. You have to do both. That's, that's, you know, the, that's part of the model. So in therapy, we're going not only, whoa, you, you think of yourself so poorly and you're afraid of driving. We're also going, why did that happen? And then we're treating that with these sort of trauma modalities and, and these more advanced therapy techniques that you write about in the book. Um, but as a child, when, when things happen to around or to children, because of the egocentricity, I see a lot of this. It's just so many layers of how they see the world are distorted. So for instance, something happens to their parents or something happens at school. That's not good. And instead of going, wow, that sucks about my parents, they say, wow, I'm a terrible child. I'm a bad person. I deserve this. Um, this must be my fault. Maybe I should have done something. Or the world sucks. Everyone sucks. I can't trust anybody. I can't trust myself. Um, I have no power. I have no control. I have no choice. And therefore, if these levels of, of kind of human autonomy and resiliency get destroyed in childhood, this is a person who could walk around and seemingly function. Maybe they work at a, I don't want to be demeaning, but like maybe they work at the easiest place they can find a job and they don't really have any power. And they're kind of just like always subject to other people. And they're like, wow, my life sucks, but I deserve it because this is how I am. There's so many layers that trauma can happen and they may not even qualify for post-traumatic stress disorder, but the trauma or adverse experiences, maybe is a better way to say it, adverse experiences, if not worked on, with in natural supports or psychotherapy um, or, you know, friends or family that can help you can turn into long-term debilitating narratives, which then these narratives are kind of connected to the symptoms that we see in the offices when they come in and they're really getting down, really getting into a bad place. So I was just curious about your thoughts about how you, you know, what, what your thoughts about are on that or, or how you address some of that in the book about the, uh, the changes in the, in the worldviews and, uh, but versus the people that are like, have this obvious thing that goes wrong that they can identify with. 
Uh, exactly. That's actually a very you, you said it, you said it so clearly and 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 ex- explained it so beautifully. It's definitely true. The child is a very egocentric being, and it's essential for their survival. So it's much easier for children to think that something is wrong with them than to think that something is wrong with their caregivers or their caregivers who are supposed to love and protect them are just incapable. A child can't survive with that uh, idea, so mm. they have to internalize and think, I must deserve this. I must deserve to be hurt this way. I must not be a good good person. And this, these narratives, they carry along with them. And the, the important and kind of uh, very uh, dangerous piece of it is that that's how trauma is passed on from generation mm. to generation. So when somebody ha- has the belief system and they're just emotionally not available, uh, they have emotionally unavailable parents, then they, then they might be emotionally unavailable parents to their own children. So that's why it's really important that we do our own work. And therapy, in many ways, allows for these narratives to shift because the therapist becomes curious about you. So when the, when the therapist is curious as to why you are thinking in the way that you're thinking, rather than telling you how to think instead of the way that you're thinking, then you start becoming curious to why you're thinking this way. So it becomes an option to even consider a different way of thinking. And also in therapy, actually, many of the therapeutic relationships represent in some ways a parent-child relationship because the therapist is there for you unconditionally, their emotional process and their troubles and day-to-day struggles really don't are not in the forefront and don't really matter. They're still humans, but they're, it's never about them. It's always about you. They're consistent. They have accountability. So when, for instance, a therapist shows up late, which could also happen, of course, because therapists are humans, um, they take accountability and they apologize. And for some people, this is such a new experience. People come from households where apology is not in the culture. So even like having experiences like this that are different, that are accepting, that are genuine, um, these kind of experiences will allow for uh, you to assess your self-worth and think about, you know, awareness and think about how it feels to be in a relationship where you're actually seen. And then it can translate outside of the therapeutic session. Yes, that's that's wonderful. I I actually I love that you're saying that because I've been really excited about all these techniques. But what we know from the research and Scott Miller's research and some other folks, uh, Wampold and some other people, I can't remember who all wrote the books, but there's a lot of people that have researched this, which is that in in psychotherapy and even with doctors, the relationship is so paramount to the healing. And that if you do have a rupture, that it's on the therapist or the doctor to repair that rupture, because a lot of people haven't experienced that, especially if they've come from a, a background that had emotional neglect or abuse or just a culture of not really understanding emotions, right? There's this rupture and then there's no repair, right? It's just like you do what you're supposed to do, or maybe you spoke until you don't speak until you're spoken to, or maybe I'm the parent, so I'm always right and you're always wrong or whatever. I don't, I have no idea, but you know, there's lots of not great scenarios out there. So if we repair as the therapist, we're also a human, but we give them an unconditional positive regard and we're there for them. It's not about us. The only thing about us is this is our profession, but it's it's not about us. It's about them. If it's customized to them, that's that can be a very healing experience. And we know that the relationship can heal. So the positive thing about psychotherapy and going to a doctor, if you have that positive relationship, you're already starting to heal. Then you add on the medication and then you add on the psychotherapy and then you add on all these advanced techniques. And it's like that that relationship allows for the treatments to work, uh, I think, more effectively. And that's what the research shows, um, which you people can look up. It's all over the place. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the, your, the, the title of the book is, I think, very important. Rewrite, W-R-I-T-E, a trauma workbook of creative writing and recovery in a new normal. So I was covering the beginning, more or less, in the first part of this podcast, which is like all the educational pieces, which I found very useful for the consumer. But you have all this, like Lee's uh, writing prompts in here, which are like, hey, uh, what do you think about 
uh, what are you feeling when this happens? And what do you think about um, uh, this Balan method of breathing? And what are your feelings about that? And has there ever been a, a time at work where you felt unsafe? And how did you cope with that? And here's some information. And um, how did your body feel in this situation? And really bringing, like you said, the word, uh, Diogo, I think you said uh, curiosity, which I liked. Uh, but I would love to talk about the writing and then the Balan uh, 321 method. Uh, so could you talk about the writing? Why did you include this writing? What's... Uh, What's up with that? That's it's pretty sweet. Like, I, I'm yeah. trying not to write too much in this book because I want to lend it to the other therapists I know. So I'm just like kind of like underlining things, but I, you know, I don't want them well, to we'll read send, all we'll my send you another copy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So what, why do we put that in there? Yeah. Personally, I write a lot, and I, in my personal healing journey, have used writing. It just has something that led to an incredible amount of self awareness and growth for me on my part. And it could be any creative expression, actually. So I work with people who are, uh, come from different artistic backgrounds. I work with actors or um, musicians. And for them, of course, if that's accessible and, and they can express their emotions through that better or easier, then that definitely I celebrate that. It's just writing is a little bit more accessible to people. It's much more, you know, that just there and also for me when we're thinking about writing the grammar and all of that spelling none of that really matters or the type of writing doesn't matter either some people really like writing letters or some people like writing poems or stories and whatever just move moves them and for me what's important is even not staying in on topic in the writing prompt I don't really care about that. For me, what's important is there are certain things that need to be said and need to be expressed. And when we start writing, it's very different than talking. So it just allows us to access certain parts of ourselves that are deeper than our talking selves that we can just uh it's it, through free, free association we might land in a place that we was very unexpected which happens a lot actually so and then that place is where the the curiosity is that that place is where the stories are where maybe the pain is so it just it, i feel like it's just a guide and a path to reach to certain areas of our psyche that maybe is not so easily accessible otherwise and and while 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 writing is uh, a critical piece of this obviously this is in the context of therapy and 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 the science but uh if somebody is hesitant to go to a psychiatrist or a therapist <clears throat> to get treatment they have the ability to write something on their phone or write something on a piece of paper so that could be the first step into understanding themselves and this really gets into the broader concept of the balance three to one method where we describe the components of getting ready to write Right. How do you, you know, are you writing when you're waiting in the grocery store line on your phone? Or do we say and what we encourage essentially in, in our writing and, and the way we talk about these things is the, the entire environment? How do you celebrate and how do you acknowledge your own body? How do you create something that might be a little bit extra special? And, and, and Duiga taught me this actually, where, you know, if you have a glass of water, make it intentional, right? And, and ha have it be maybe add a little piece of lemon in it. I would never think if I, if I wasn't with her, I would never think of putting lemon in my water. I mean, it's just so different for me, but it's special. All of a sudden you see the lemon floating in your water and you know, it might taste a little bit lemony, but you know that it's intentionally, you did it, you cut the lemon. This is for me. It's just for me. It's a little bit different. And then how do you, you might, you might have a candle. You might have a, a place where you have nice pillows and now you're setting the body or you're setting the environment. I'm going to put my phone on mute. I'm going to set one hour aside or five minutes aside, whatever you have available to you. And then now you're setting the, the intention. How do I know that my body is ready? And we talk specifically about not only the physiological benefits of breathing and how it calms and, and regulates the nervous system, but also how it prepares you to uh, get out of this fight or flight mode into this, you know, the opposite is rest and digest, but uh, the, sort of it's it's not as commonly sort of discussed, but really to be able to say, okay, now I'm ready and so sit down and I'm calm in an environment that's relatively safe, relatively free of distractions, and to then sit down and now the prompt is essentially 
just that. So we have different various uh, prompts that we've used before in the past. So these are all, you know, very specifically chosen that we included in the book, but they are, as Duiga mentioned, a gateway to additional creativity, additional exploration. And the last component in the, the one sort of piece is that affirmation. It could be something like a gratitude. It could be something, an intention that you put forward into your mind. And as you're coming out of it, right, think of it as you're ending the therapeutic session, you know, you just don't unravel everything and say, okay, 50 minutes is up. See you later. You know, you start to have closure and, and even mini termination within the session. And then you open the door and it's time for them to leave. And you, your next patient comes and they go, whatever, to their, to their next thing that they need to do. And so how do you then close that with this intention to then have this experience? The, the, the writing component, though, is different in many ways because it creates, again, to this concept of an artifact. It's like a time capsule. You can go back to it and judgment-free, as Duiga was talking. It doesn't matter the style of writing, the language of writing, what color pen you use, or if you even if you write or not, or you could scribble. It doesn't matter. But it's that artifact to then say, okay, this is something that I created. And if you want to, if you want to, you can then bring this up to your therapist, your clinician, your friend, your loved one, somebody that you trust that can work with this completely optional, but it's something that you can take with you. And it's something that you've created and it's yours. But also you can also destroy it. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that's the beauty of it. So there might be something that you uh, just are holding and you cannot express. And then once it's in the paper, it's out, but then you don't want to keep it anymore. And you, you can make people do rituals around this, around uh, getting rid of, of something, right? Like around destroying their work or um, just making it, uh, unavailable for anybody to find whatever the reason for this is it's the important piece is to first get it out once it's expressed and once these we you allow yourself to feel these emotions then it, getting ri- kind of getting rid of it or making it just disappear can be a very reassuring feeling as well so whichever works <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah now you had like three pages here explaining not only you know giving yourself permission and not only the setting and the breath and the body and all that you talked about in the three two one method but just like you don't there's like no rules to the writing there's no like you don't have to be traditional about it you don't have to like clean up your paper you don't have to like work on grammar but then and it does give you a control because it is something you can do and and then i was uh, and then you quote all of these studies for like two pages that expressive writing has an impact on decrease in dif- dysphoric mood which is like a ongoing low lying depression decrease in depressed mood and decrease in anxious mood and so it's and and i love that because i've seen that right people i i oftentimes clients have said i hate writing i don't want to write anything I, because <laughs> it's embarrassing right to think about putting my deep dark thoughts on paper because you can actually in some ways even if you're just drawing a picture or scribbling in some ways you can almost get deeper than you would through language um and and really tell some truths that you may not want to ever utter aloud and so um and like you said in here there's <laughs> There are no, there are minimal to no risks of side effects other than time, which I like. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> and, and and like, it's personalized. You can do it any way you want. And like, like I, you know, you, you could cut it up, throw it away, burn it in a controlled uh, receptacle so you don't light anything on fire. <laughs> but it can be like almost a ritual, right, for you. And and it's so powerful because it, 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 unwa- it, it lets off of your shoulders, maybe something that you didn't, couldn't, or didn't know where or how to express. So um, I thought that was really a great idea. And the funny thing is, and I've done some writing myself, is it's like, it's so easy. And I wrote like, it's like there's a resistance to like putting your thoughts on paper or whatever, because it's preserving it, I guess, or whatever for me. But I just like wrote a page the other day and I was like, wow, I feel like way better. This is weird. Like what the hell? Like it was just like, and I don't even want to look at it again. I think I'm going to toss it, but it was so easy. And so then giving, it's like another tool for, for people to use at home that, um, that is almost zero investment. I mean, if you're in complete poverty, you can go to a bank, walk in and grab a free uh, sucker or a lollipop and you can grab a free pen at the, they're there. Just grab it and leave and say, sorry, I decided not to bank here. That, and then you just have to find paper, right? And most people can find paper somewhere 
or something to write on or an old book from, you know, the goodwill or something, anyone can almost do this and you don't have to be completely literate either. That's the other thing. You could draw fo- pictures, you could scribble. Um, and so it's, it's very accessible. Whereas, you know, psychotherapy is becoming more and more accessible thanks to different policies and, and education around it. But, you know, still it's limited. It doesn't get as far, uh, it doesn't get to as many full people as we wish it did. I think, um, so yeah, tell me uh, about your your method. This method you don't have to t- give it a whole thing away. So people need to read the book, but like, what did? How did you come up with this method, the Balan method? Sure. sure. So so uh, well, I mean, d- 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 this is Duyga's baby, but but before, <laughs> oh, before okay. that, just very very briefly, I mean, before before that, very briefly, I, I just want to say just uh, in, in in follow up of of your previous comments, you know, Paul, you're the expert in violence prevention. I wanted to say thank you for the amazing work that you're doing, specifically with with the with the helpline and 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 all of the the writing that you do. And so one of the interesting things, and and this goes back to sort of maybe a little more esoteric dynamic uh, work, but sort of the the aggressivity turned inwards versus the aggressivity. Uh, to turn to outwards, where we see sort of self-destructive behaviors, but also the significant increase in outward violence uh, that we're seeing, especially in society and and uh, with with you know the criminality, but really sort of that expressivity. And so something that might be interesting, and this could be a plug or a seed or or, or nothing, uh, but is to look at how do these kind of modalities and methods uh, decrease or even prevent uh, violent expressions. And so this could be you know something that could be we could look at sort of going forward. But uh, that, that's where I just want to say one, thank you for the work that you're doing. Two. Um, amazing and please keep doing it and i like how its emphasis is prevention of violence right as opposed to response etc and and so i just wanted to put that plug in it, it was just completely on my own but i just want to say well, thank, thank you, you. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you yeah um so i i think writing as you said it's just it's, it's just a lot more uh, accessible and also it just allows the person to spend a little bit time with themselves. So in, in our society right now, it's so much demand on our time, so many things that we're juggling. And for parents, many parents are actually, even though we always say it takes a village to parent, most people parent on their own. Uh, there's so many things that that are just demanding our attention all the time that it's really hard for people to actually step aside and and even realize what they're thinking and and Mm. realize what what their emotions are. We're just uh, autopiloting a lot of things in our lives. And then it's just, that's how people fall into certain patterns. And that's how we might not recognize certain things that keep repeating, certain stories that keep repeating. So this, this writing exercise, the main for me, the main goal was for people to just spend a little bit of time with themselves and mm-hmm. get curious about themselves so that they could build some awareness. And even that just does go such a long way. So even if you write nothing during that time and you just sit in this corner of your house that feels welcoming to you and you light a little candle and you listen to your favorite song, even that is self-care and that is you giving yourself something a gift a little bit of sliver of time and a little bit of affection that even goes a long way and then coupled with trying to figure out your body and trying to understand you know what's going on in my body where why am i feeling why am i tensing my shoulders why am i ten- clenching my jaw like even that kind of just becoming aware, which is why the balance method has a lot of body kind of body awareness too in it is because we just hold so many things in our bodies and we can't actually, as I said before, we can't actually process emotions or feel our feelings if we are in such tense anxiety mode. So uh, the balance method just allows for you to relax your own nervous system, first recognize it, then uh, then figure out what works for you. Yeah. Yes, I agree with that. I think, unfortunately, uh, there's a multitude of factors, including technology and economics and habits and cultural influences that have led to people having very little time that they that they seem to spend reflecting on their own lives or expressing feelings on their own lives. People spend a lot of time, like you said, 
Netflix was very popular and Apple TV and all the other streaming services during the pandemic. But uh, people spend a lot of time consuming information or consuming entertainment or consuming food, or there's a massive number of people that report being lonely and having no friends or hardly any friends at all. And I just was in a, there was an article that came out in the counseling today about the loneliness epidemic. And you can look that up. Uh, about the stats of people reporting loneliness and low friends and family contact or people they don't want to contact. Uh, and so these these factors, I, I feel like, are getting us away from this art of, or this, this ability to, as a society, reflect and sit with our own stuff. And if you, like you mentioned, the National Violence Prevention Hotline that I've been trying to work on getting started, which is a big ordeal. But anyway... I, I do see violence uh, oftentimes, not the reactionary violence, but the violence that's planned out as a, or, uh, and I mean by reactionary, I mean like um, interpersonal people are yelling at each other at a bar or in a relationship. That's that's different type of dynamic violence. But the violence that's sort of planned out and and sort of symbolic, these sort of mass shootings or, you know, coming to your workplace or something like this is a, in a way somebody's trying to express something that's held in they haven't they haven't expressed it and 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 this is symbolic in a way even though it's destructive and horrible it's it's a it's a symbol of of something that has not been expressed and perhaps it could have been expressed verbally or with writing or with a friend or with a therapist or anything else but because of the isolation and all the other factors that we want to say that people don't feel that freedom to do this or don't have the skill to do this or whatever it's coming out in this extreme way because it's been bottled up for so long um so i do see that not only with mental health and helping people feel better which this book is about and getting your life back as a society i think there's a lost art and a need for downtime dr dan siegel um md out of uh, California, who writes a lot about interpersonal neurobiology, talks about the, some core components of brain health. And one of those is downtime and time to reflect. And I think that is something that, especially in the United States, is a, <laughs> not exactly popular. So um, I think this book is hitting on that with the the writing expression and making that space to breathe and making that that kind of like intentional space away from what I would call noise, uh, cultural noise, whether there's positive noise like kids in the playground and to your work and going to school and all of that, but all of the other noise, all of the advertising, all of the social media, all of the TV and programs and um, constant noise if you're in a city. I know, uh, doctor, you've got to run to an appointment, but uh, I appreciate your time. And uh, But I, I wonder if... if part of mental health's job here as a as a career or as a paradigm is that we also need to not only keep improving our treatments in the treatment room but bring our our research findings and our anecdotal evidence to schools businesses uh hopefully the government or and other facets to sort of kind of increase our impact what are your any thoughts on that Definitely. I also think that, you know, things are changing in the way that now we're talking about these things a lot more. And even though these these conversations are uncomfortable, like conversations around the demand of uh, on the on the individual, the work environment or conversations around domestic violence, Mm -hmm. abuse, child abuse, these kind of conversations in the past, the idea was always no one wants to hear about it, which led to a lot of isolation, which mm-hmm. led to survivors believing that they were the only ones experiencing these uh, these events and, and experience growing up in abusive households. And this loneliness just created kind of a soil where these kind of things just kept on repeating. People hurt people tend to find hurt people. So toxic patterns just keep continuing. And if we don't talk about these issues, then what ends up happening is this trauma just gets passed on from generation to generation. Now, I think we're seeing it so much more. I think there's a lot more room and we sh- there should be a lot more conversation, but it's still improving. We see certain uh, different kind of aspects of suffering 
uh, and domestic violence and all this uh, suicide, all these the things we see it a lot more in mainstream media. It's a lot more talked about. And I think we just need to have more and more conversation about how trauma affects us as an individual, but also it actually affects communities. It, it just is something that keeps spreading unless we shed light to it. Oh, I really like how you said that, uh, Diogo. I think that's really a poignant, a really salient point that you're right. There has been more mainstream television and articles on the internet and social media that are learning about trauma and the nervous system, learning about mental health and kind of, hey, how, you know, what can we know about this and and talk about these tough topics where you're right, in the past, society was like, oh, this stuff doesn't happen. And we don't talk about this, right? That was kind of the regressive um, society we found ourselves in even 10 years ago. I mean, <laughs> I remember coming out of grad school in the early 2000s and people st there was a, that stigma was still really thick in certain areas and then it, it stuck around even in sort of the intelli intelligentsia of the cities where people say oh well, i would only go to therapy if something really bad happened right and now it's becoming more like oh wow maybe i should go to therapy because i'm just not feeling right maybe i need a tune-up maybe i need to go for three months and kind of like work through some issues and or hey, like couples therapy is getting more popular, right? Like, hey, our relationship, I want to, I want to improve our relationship. And now, um, you know, parenting, getting into parenting, how can I improve my parenting? And how can I impact that? And, and schools, ones with funding, are bringing in mindful schools and doing breathing exercises and teaching kids about self esteem. So you're right, it is improving. But it's going to take a lot more conversations and hopefully things like this where people can listen and, and get educated about these things because you don't have to be a therapist or a doctor to learn about this stuff. You can learn about these things from books like yours and podcasts and start trying to impact your community. And I think that's an important point. What are your thoughts about that? Yes. And, and I think the more that we actually have these conversations, the more that it just becomes it has less power over us. So that's that's I think one of the most important pieces of trauma treatment is these difficult events or these difficult memories just hold so much power over us. But when we start actually talking about them, then we are empowering ourselves and we're taking the power back, which is why it's so important to to be able to have these discussions that there's more podcasts like this, that there's more books and more mainstream media around certain struggles that people go to because we, we're not alone in this. And there's such an idealized version of the human, an idealized version of, of the family and the school system and everything, which, you know, in reality, there's, there's not, nothing is ideal. So in reality, there's so many people who come from households with, from less than, less ideal circumstances where maybe they were shunned for difficult emotions and all, all sorts of things. So, by by allowing people to come forward with these experiences and these stories, it just makes it so that we are not alone. Oh, I think that is a very amazing point, is that I do think that the human story relied so much on, in the last multiple centuries, of some sort of what I would call grand narrative. So like there was the big narrative of like, it's our tribe and our culture versus the world. And then there was, this is a very gross thing. I'm meaning like a very generalized situation, but like, then there was this ideal of the family and the church and the, like the community and how that was supposed to be. Right. And now I think what's happening in our human evolution is we're going, Hey, this is my actual experience. What's your actual experience like? Right. And yeah, we want to have the nuclear family and to have our neighbors and these ideas, right. And interact with our community, but how does it actually work? How is it actually feeling for you? Right. Tell your story. And I think stories, like you said, like, with the trauma story, maybe in treatment, we may now want to repeat that over and over, but what is your overall story? Where do you want your story to be, right? Let's get creative about that and let's share with each other in your community how you're actually doing and learn how to actually have those conversations. Like you said, there was cultural, you know, in the, in the United States is a bit more of a melting pot, but, um, you know, I have relatives that came from certain different countries in Europe and 
and uh, other places. And they had these sort of strict rules about what was allowed in the household and how you were supposed to say it and what you were supposed to do. And, and in a way that helped human culture evolve probably from a bit more of a chaotic, uh, situation, but, uh, in another way, it's over, it's an overcorrection perhaps of our, of, of our uh, controlling our expression. So I wanted to, I know we got to wrap pretty soon, but I wanted to kind of, you and, uh, Yenair had some pretty cool um, quotes that you threw out, put in the book throughout just for kind of to kind of give you like a philosophical point. But one of the quotes I liked because you were talking about community and establishing trust and therapeutic alliance and relationship and interpersonal connections and the importance of these things was you said, we grow in compassion and we wither in criticism. I don't know if you had any thing to say about that or if there was any. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 that kind of goes uh, back into the notion where in an idealized version of family, we are thought to love our family unconditionally and be really grateful for their sacrifices. But there are many people who come from families where their needs were not met, where mm. they were neglected, or they were just outright abusive. So in situations like this, where there's so much um, you know, conflict, the, the what gets in, internalized is the inner critic. So we start becoming really harsh with ourselves when we come from environments where our needs weren't met, where we weren't nurtured in, in a way that we needed. So that, I think, speaks to that. So when we are able to give ourselves compassion in whatever form that is, whether that's seeking out um, therapy or whether that's just putting a little bit of time aside for ourselves or prioritizing the things that we love. That is what compassion, self-compassion actually is. And we really grow in that. Very good. I love that. And I think another thing I'm hearing from you is you and Yanar was about this awareness and connections and, and being honest about your experience. And so I think one of the honest things, if you look at the lifespan psychology books, is that we all are going to go through some type of trauma. It's going to suck. And we're all going to have, uh, you know, loss and positives and negatives, um, depending on where you live. Obviously, some people are growing up in places that are horrifically awful and they're getting mostly negatives. But in, in, in the U.S. here, we kind of, you have an opportunity. People have opportunities to kind of mm, move around a little bit more, let's say, um, than, than uh, some places. Um, and there was a quote by Yanera in here that said, uh, I am grateful for these human connections that have enabled me to get up when I fall and that keep me going one step at a time. And I thought that was really important because he's talking, he's a, he's, you and him are both like accomplished professionals. Yet in this situation, he's talking about these connections he had, like he's had hard times and that's to be expected. And so the importance of having people in your life friends or a family or chosen family that you can talk to and share problems and share successes with are so important to mental health and physical health. Actually, obviously that's a whole nother podcast, but how mental health affects your physiology is a whole nother topic, but it's Definitely. real. So I, I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to say about that. Cause you obviously have known each other for quite a while. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, as, as you said, it's it's life. We are all going to have difficult experiences. We're all going to have periods of self doubt and insecurities. We all have our our own woundings. And the thing is that people get injured in relationships, but people also heal in relationships. And actually, that's in my opinion a very the, not I wouldn't say maybe only way, but I, an essential way of healing. We thrive in community. We are built to uh, be in connection to one another. We're not really built to tackle everything on our own. And I think in the way that society is today, there's a lot of individualism and there's a lot of notion of not needing and not asking. And that is actually really toxic and really hurtful and creates a lot of damage. But in re because we actually just thrive and grow 
when we're with one another. And we uh, are very lucky to, our families are still in Turkey. We're very lucky that we have a lot of chosen family here. And it, the pandemic actually was a very identifying time for us and where we were like, who can we call right now? And we'll pick up the phone and we can have a conversation and maybe share a little bit of laughs or um, just vent. And that that we were very intentional about reaching out to the people that we cared about and to allow for people to in need to reach out to us because that's the only that's the very human thing to do. Yes, I agree. I think um yeah, I've, I mean not like we're giving out mental health tips on the podcast, but a big tip is it can you find friends that honor you and are not exploitative and or family, right? So there's this old metaphor I want to I want to say because I agree, I think we do need more collectivism especially in the United States, but there's this fear of collectivism. And so, and this is my metaphor for that, is that, you know, some people have had bad experiences being really close to people. So what that is, is something you can learn in therapy and you can learn from books and you can learn through going through your own process is how to set boundaries with people. And boundaries are, are so that's another podcast, but boundaries are important to learn. And the metaphor I had was that there was a family of porcupines and they all hung out together. But then one of them would get upset and all its quills uh, would go into the other porcupines because it was standing too close, right? But they all wanted to be together, but then it kept hurting each other. And every time they get upset, then the other one would spike the other one. So that they learn is that they could all stand in a little circle together, but they had to stand a couple of feet apart or a couple of inches apart so that when they got upset, they were close enough to talk about it, but not hurt each other with their quills. And that's a good way to, to talk about with the boundaries is that as you try to form your friend groups, if you hurt each other, can you talk about it? Can you learn to adjust what your expectations and boundaries and communication patterns are with those folks so that you don't keep re-injuring each other? And I think that's a that's a long-term process. And obviously, and we're not going to give the answer in today's podcast, but a good way to start is to start with your own story. And that's where your book starts. Um, yeah. So for that's people out metaphor, there... What's that? I love that metaphor. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. I did not come up with it, but uh, I will... Uh, it, but I will uh, give the person credit at some point. Um, I need to remember who told me that. But uh, anyway, so yeah, it, it's it's something, if you're going to start, you've got to start with yourself and where you're at. And even if where you're at sucks, excuse my non-clinical language, but if if you feel as a listener out there that you're like, man, my life is horrible right now. A good way to start is to start writing about your life, is to start looking for resources in your community, start looking for people that help you feel safe and not exploited or hurt. Um, Rewrite is the book, a trauma workbook of creative writing and the recovery in our new normal. And I'll have links to the book and uh, the websites of, um, again, Aaron Diogo, uh, Balan's websites and you know everything you both are doing because you're both practitioners as well and and writers and you I guess this is you've had you already wrote a different book this is your second book I believe right it's your second published book mm -hmm. yeah. yes um, and so for all the listeners out there they can um, check this out and check out your website and your resources and I guess it looks like you also have social media so they can connect you on there. So I'll put all of that in the show notes, which you can just click on below this podcast. You're probably listening. Most people are listening to this on an app, although we do have a large YouTube crowd. So you might have to, to Google any last words you wanted to say kind of to the listeners out there. Um, we all thank you so much for this time and thank you so much for everything uh, that you that you do. And for the listeners, I think, you know, it, it's just wherever you're at, you, you're you at the right place. And for people who, th who when they become aware uh, about things and they think, oh, I wish I knew about this before, I, I always like to say the, the time was now. The time of, of your journey starts now and there's never, you're never late. Very good. I, I appreciate that, uh, Diogo. And thanks to you and Yener for your time today and, and your work. And I really think it's awesome that you put this book out there and it's going to impact a lot of people. So um, thank you for those words to listeners. I agree completely. And it's been my pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
And there you have it. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please share it with people you know. I would surely appreciate it. Or take just a minute to give us a rating on iTunes. As most of you know, I am passionate about preventing future violence in the United States. My colleagues and I have started a nonprofit called the National Violence Prevention Hotline, a 501c3 organization. We are endeavoring to gain funding and collaborators so that we can start a 24 7 hotline and chat line to reach potential perpetrators before they act violently. It is a bold effort to save lives and curb violence by working to connect with potential offenders while they are in the planning stages of violence, help to de escalate them and provide resources so that they can get appropriate professional help. The National Violence Prevention Hotline is looking to open up a conversation about violence in society, the causes, and the solutions. You can learn more by visiting our website, www.violencepreventionhotline.org. Join us online by signing our petition on the website, sharing the website with your network of people, Donating to the cause if you like, and you can now even write your congressperson from our website with a simple form. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you are a therapist looking for ethical and excellent medical billing services, check out therapistbillingservicesllc.com. That's www.therapistbillingservicesllc.com. Billing services created by therapists for therapists. If you're looking for an EMDR International Association consultant, I am a consultant and I can provide you the 20 hours you need to become EMDRIA certified. I have groups online and in person and I do individual consultation. Just send me a message at the website and I'll get back to you. If you want to get trained in EMDR therapy, check out the great training opportunities with EMDR Training Solutions. I've worked with them before and they are phenomenal, so register today. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment at a local counseling center in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area at Health for Life Counseling and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting www.healthforlifegr.com. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest. And while these are based on the literature they have read and the experience in their fields, this should not be viewed as a definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you're in a crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 988. You can also text 741741 and a live trained crisis counselor will respond. Did you know you could support your local bookstore by shopping at www.bookshop.org? You can order from the comfort of your own home online while supporting local brick and mortar businesses near you. If you are a therapist and you are not a member of your national or local therapy organizations such as the American Counseling Association or the American Mental Health Counselors Association, please get involved. At least pay the dues. It will help the lobbyists in our field keep us from becoming gig workers. And of course, there's the bonus of increasing mental health education around the United States and helping people understand what counseling is and promoting best practices within our profession. Until next time, I wish you all a safe and peaceful week.